a lot of people were asking, is, is Paul depressed? He's showing all the signs of depression. But it wasn't something I was thinking about at the time or probably prepared to admit. Um, eventually, I did reach out for help. Yeah, it, it was a very lonely place for me personally. There was one particular lad who, who really suffered. It was more of an anxiety thing. Well, the people on site never made his life particularly great. And when he finally told everybody, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm suffering from, they weren't particularly supportive. He was, the jokes, rather than being at him, were kind of said behind his back. And uh, he, he left shortly afterwards. He had no support from his, from his peers or, or bosses, to be honest. My name's Paul, I'm 44, always lived in Coventry. Um, traditionally always worked in the construction industry, but um, about eight years ago I started volunteering at Mind. And I've, in the last four or five months, become ambassador for Coventry and Watching Mind as well. I suppose with, with my own personal uh, mental health, it started in childhood. Um, I just remember being ultra shy especially at primary school. My hair <laughs> colour being red at the time, it's gone darker now. Uh, stick out ears, I was always a, a figure of fun, really. Um, not too bad, but uh, as I got to adulthood, it kind of left me with severe self-esteem issues, not particularly liking myself, which meant that initially when I started work, I wasn't particularly um, engaging with, with people at work, and that led to issues. Um, but it kind of then manifested itself in quite a bit of depression in my mid to late uh, 20s. Um, and then in the last three or four years before I had a bit of a breakdown, uh, a lot of people were asking, is, is Paul depressed? He's showing all the signs of depression. But it wasn't something I was thinking about at the time or probably prepared to admit. Um, eventually, I did reach out for help, but uh, I'd started thinking that my family would be better off without me, that kind of thing. Uh, and those thoughts were getting stronger and stronger. Uh, and then I obviously finally asked for help. Uh, and people were already starting to get me the help anyway. They could see the way I was going. Before I had support, I felt very lonely, um, as though nobody else really understood where I was coming from. Quite often things that were, I suppose, quite real for me when I was feeling down, people were saying, oh, you were really withdrawn today. Why were you like that? It's embarrassing especially around family and friends. If we were at parties and I was withdrawn, you didn't really get involved, you know. Um, and although I would say why why I was like that, I don't think anybody really truly, it felt as though I was misunderstood, um, especially on the shyness thing. I'm still not very good at that, <laughs> uh, blending at parties and, and mingling. But um, yeah, it, it was a very lonely place for me personally. One day, I was, I was in a particularly bad way, um, very, almost like, it, it felt as a panic attack. Um, my whole world was coming crashing down around me. Um, I reached out and I just, it was just a quick text message to the girlfriend, can you come home? I, I need help. Um, and she obviously came rushing home. She rang my mum, she's a nurse. Um, so she come, they came, they came straight back to the house. Um, and initially, they spent the entire morning ringing around various services, trying to find out what to do, where to go. They they weren't they didn't know where to go themselves, um, and they were knocked back quite a bit. Um, crisis teams would say, "We we can't come out today. It'll, it'll be in a couple of weeks' time." That kind of thing. So, one of them suggested just go just go straight to hospital, um, take him to hospital. He, he clearly needs calming down. So I went to the hospital. A mental health team came over from Derby because it was just after the six o'clock in the evening cutoff. So I had to wait a couple of hours in the side room, but eventually was assessed. They said he's clearly really depressed. Um, they gave me a bit of medication to calm me down and make me help me sleep that night, and then suggested going to the doctor the following day. And so I went to the doctor. Initially, the doctor wasn't particularly helpful. He hadn't seen the notes from the hospital, so he's a bit dismissive, or I wouldn't say dismissive, reluctant to. Uh, help me until he's seen a bit more maybe from the hospital but then the doctor actually in the end being ended up being probably one of the better 
the better people I spoke to at the time. He, um, he set me on the right path. So we did short term, medium term and long term plans. Um, and that helped really focus your mind just, just by writing it down. It was, it was a big help. Um, one of those medium term uh, plans was to volunteer somewhere to give myself some sort of kind of self-esteem. Uh, and that's how I ended up volunteering at Mind in the end. It was, seemed the perfect place to, to volunteer. Yeah, I suppose um, one of my main anxieties was um, uh, particularly as I had my depression, um, things were starting to, the reason why I went pop was there was, a, there was plenty of little incidences, things that, you know, on their own, a lot of people go through, but they were starting to, I always felt I was the rock in the family. People could rely on me. There was a miscarriage. Uh, I, I was made redundant during the uh, financial crash, 2009, day my son was born. There was uh, quite a lot of build up and pressure, um, but it led to anxiety, I think, because I'd lost my job during the, uh, during the financial crash. It took a long time. There was Brexit on the way on the horizon when I finally went, went pop. There was, there was a lot of talk about recessions and those sort of, the pressure of not being able to provide, especially for my son and my daughter, who was born shortly afterwards, and those sort of pressures built up and build up. And I suppose at my work, when I finally went pop, one of my big fears, I remember having my panic attack was, I'm gonna lose my job here. My experience of maybe a stigma in the workplace has always been, obviously I work in the construction industry. Um, it, it sounds a bit cliche, but there's always two sides to it. There's the office side of it. Um, and that's never been, never been an issue, but out on site, but especially when I started, there's a lot of, um, it, it's a quite a laddie culture out on site. And there was one particular lad who, re who really suffered. It was more of an anxiety thing. The people on site never made his life particularly great. And when he finally told everybody, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm suffering from, they weren't particularly supportive. He was, the jokes, rather than being at him, were kind of said behind his back, but he still, so he did, by being honest, all he did was hide, you know, push, push it into the background. Um, and uh, he, he left shortly afterwards. He had no support from his, from his peers or, or bosses, to be honest. Obviously important to be supported in your workplace. Um, I know when I was younger and I first started out, I didn't feel supported. Um, and you, you just end up with a disengaged employee who's not interested. He doesn't want to, you know, I didn't want to work at the time. I, I dreaded going to work, but I felt I had to, um, with, without that support, you, you, you're not, you're not going to get the best out of them. Uh, and to be honest, they'll, they'll just end up feeling worse about themselves and eventually leaving. Uh, I, I, I can't see the reason why <laughs> you wouldn't support that, that employee, really. Things that would have helped, obviously, were would have been the things that we have these sort of today. We have, you know, there was no mental health first aiders back then. There was no uh, helplines to ring. Um, and people, people obviously probably didn't feel uh, that they could talk to anybody. Uh, I know my line manager's been on training recently uh, on how to look out for those signs within your employees. Um, we had an employee two, three years ago. It was quite obvious that he was suffering. Um, and, and my line manager picked up on that and asked me to go and could you, ha you know, you, you have that confidential chat. None of these things were in place years ago. Um, and he was, you know, he sought and got the help that he needed via the company. Uh, we're current, they're currently running an internal course at work about uh, mental health line managers, what to spot, how to approach it, how to deal with it, um, but also calling out any particular behaviours. Um, the one lad who, who was suffering at our workplace a few years ago, he was still, there's still, <laughs> as much as people talk about it, there's still occasionally the odd little joke in the in the in the in the kitchen, you know. When, and and he he spotted that. He called it out and said, I, I, "I don't want to hear you saying that again." You know, this guy is clearly not in a good place. He's getting the help. You know, he, he needs your support. 
So I think backing as a line manager, if you can back your employees and, and support them in that way, not just directly, but indirectly with, with your colleagues, I think that's a good way to go. I, I've seen it happen and it, it worked, it worked well. If you know that that framework is there, it gives you more confidence to approach your your management and say, do you know what? I'm really stressed, or I'm really struggling, or um, our work. Obviously, the last probably three four years, I think, as as more conversations happened around mental health, they've trained. I think we've got around 12, 12 mental health first aiders in our uh, three in the office. And the rest, all every every one of our building sites will have a mental health first data. I suppose there's still a there is still a stigma attached to it, and uh, as much as obviously working with mind, and I, I talk about mental health a lot. Sometimes maybe I don't practice as much as I preach. <laughs> I should maybe take my own advice sometimes and and, and be a bit more uh, willing to talk about it. But normally, once I do open up, people are quite are quite good around that. The amount of friends that have, have come to me with their issues, problems since. Speak to a family member uh, or close friend if they have, someone they can trust anyway. Um, and if possible, go and speak to your GP. Um, a lot of people I've spoken to who've, who've come to me previously said the day they went to the GP was the day that they realised things might move forward. Um, talking, I know people that have talked to friends that then don't go to the GP and it, it never really moved on. They said going to the GP was the one thing that kind of pushed it to the next level. It, they felt as though they were moving forward with their issue. A good day for me is to get up and feel as though I can just get up and go and go to work. Um, there have been times in the past where it takes all of my energy just to get to work. So a good day would be to get up, go to work, and not have the weight of expectation on, me, on my shoulders, really.